everybody to uh, the January meeting of uh, Twin Tiers Five Rivers. It's, it's really good to have you. And it's really good to have uh, our speaker, Pat Dorsey. Um, let's see. So I did start the recording. And uh, I want to share a few club announcements here uh, before we let Pat talk. Um, I want to remind folks that our February meeting will also be Zoom only. Uh, we're doing January and February as Zoom only. Um, and our speaker that night is Tim Kamisa. He's going to be talking about uh, successful strategies for trout. Uh, this particular meeting is uh, co-sponsored with our friends from uh, Leon Chandler Trout Unlimited. Um, so we're actually going to do uh, this and the May meeting uh, co-sponsored with uh, Leon Chandler. Uh, back in March, uh, we'll be uh, back in person at the American Legion. Um, and this will be our first ever gear swap. So watch for announcements on what that means. Um, I don't even know yet. We're um, just figuring that out. Um, I want to uh, pass along an invitation to join the club trip to the fly fishing show at Edison, New Jersey. Um, this used to be the world's largest fly fishing show. I think it still is. And um, our our club trip uh, is a carpool. We leave at uh, Friday morning, uh, oh, dark 30, and return late Sunday uh, afternoon. Uh, we have a, a block of hotel rooms uh, set up. And so far, we have seven folks going. Uh, if you'd like to join the group, please uh, give me an email um, and uh, we'd love to have you join us. Uh, Pat's going to be one of the highlighted speakers uh, at, at the uh, fly fishing show in Edison. Um, there are tons and tons of speakers. Uh, uh, often it's 10 to 15 uh, talks going on concurrently. Uh, casting demonstrations, uh, booze from rod makers. Uh, it is a huge, huge show. There's there's probably a hundred different fly tires there, uh, and it's a it's a blast uh, to join the the club. Uh, we have a lot of fun in the evenings, uh, so please feel invited to join us. Um. I want to pass along uh, uh, encouragement to sign up or to to talk to your fishing buddies, those people who said, gee, I'd really like to try fly fishing or, gee, I'd really like to improve on my fly fishing. Our annual fly fishing school is uh, is all set for May 4th. This is an all-day school uh, up at Bill Wirtz's uh, property. Uh, we have access to a large lake. Uh, all the 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 uh, classroom is done inside, uh, but then we we cast, we do tactics, and we fish in the lake, which uh, is a relatively new thing for us to do at this school. This, by the way, is our 16th annual school. Uh, we limit the students to 22. So um, we have filled to capacity the last two years. So if you have somebody you think uh, would be a great student, please pass along the invitation to come. Uh, you need to pre-register and we'd encourage folks to get their registration and payment completed so they don't lose the spot. We don't fill. Um, and uh, the, the publicity just issued through email through the MailChimp and it issued on our Facebook page as well. So um, it's uh, all, all registrations are now open. 
Uh, for those of you that might be new to the club, uh, we'd like to encourage everyone to subscribe to our emails. We send out uh, emails on the club to about 400 or so folks. And all you have to do is ask to be on our email list and we'll keep you informed of club activities. Um, we welcome you to join us uh, for a fishing trip program, um, fly, or fly fishing school, et cetera. And, um, and hope that you'll eventually uh, join our club. So if you hit this QR code, um, this will take you right to the sign up sheet uh, right at the base of our webpage. Um, we'd also like to encourage you to like our Facebook page. Uh, this is our second outlet for information. We're now about 280 uh, folks on our Facebook page. And uh, we also uh, put out key club announcements on Facebook. Uh, and if you hit this QR code, you'll, you'll link up. Uh, lastly, uh, just to say that uh, recordings of tonight's programs and all our uh, past programs, uh, at least since we started doing this post pandemic, are all on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, this is a QR link to the YouTube channel, so if you want to go back and you don't have to freak about the notes, uh, you'll be able to watch it later. All right. And a final reminder that everything we do is funded by uh, your generosity. We have found since doing these virtual programs that our virtual audience is very generous and has helped us out in form of donations, buying raffle tickets, and so forth. Um, we don't get any money from uh, FFI National. All the money that we use for programs like this comes from your generosity. So if you'd like to help us out, uh, there's a QR code to, uh, to help. So, wow, it's, uh, I'm super thrilled uh, about uh, tonight's speaker. Uh, Pat Dorsey. Um, Pat joins us from uh, Parker, Colorado. Uh, Pat has been guiding for uh, nearly 30 years. He spends 200 days uh, a year on the water. He's the head guide and co-owner of Blue Quill Angler Fly Shop in Evergreen, where I've been, uh, and he oversees a staff of over 25 guides. Uh, it's a great shop, by the way. Uh, Pat will be talking tonight on tailwater fisheries, uh, where I think that most would say he's the, one of the most recognized experts on tailwater trout. Um, his home water is the South Platte, though he guides all over Colorado and hosts trips to all over the world to Alaska, Argentina, and other exotic places. Um, He's a headliner at national fly fishing shows. He's uh, He will be featured at Edison. And um, he's spoken at TU and FFI clubs all over the country. Uh, he's an author of five books. I own four of them. Uh, he's ex written extensively for fly fishing magazines uh, and his innovative fly patterns uh, fill many fly boxes, uh, including my own, uh, the Top Secret Midge, Black Beauty, the Mercury series of nymphs are just a few uh, of um, folks that fish demanding uh, trout water have leaned on uh, based on Pat's innovations. Pat's married uh, and he was married in his drift boat, which I think is the coolest thing ever. Uh, he has five children. Uh, one of his uh, sons I met in, in November, uh, Forrest, and he's following in his dad's footsteps, uh, building a career in the fly fishing uh, business. Oh, and if you want to see the books, there they are. So with, uh, with that, uh, let me turn the stage over to, uh, to Pat. We're going to stop the share. We're going to 
highlight uh, Pat. Okay. Pat, you can share. Okay, let's go here. Everybody see that okay? Looks good. Okay. Well, I just gotta get rid of you guys don't see that black bar on there? No. Okay. Can try to move that down, but I guess we're just gonna leave it where it is. Oh, um, Pat, I forgot to mention uh to everybody to hold your questions to the end, if you would. That sounds great. That sounds great. Well, I'm really looking forward to spending the next hour with everybody. And yeah, I, I love catching tough trout, you know, with small flies. And and for me, that's always been the pinnacle of the sport is to just catch a fly, I've catch a fish on a fly you've tied. And I've been so blessed to, have, you know, grow up on the, on the South Platte River, some of the most difficult and some of the most technical challenging uh, fishing, you know, in the Rocky Mountain West. So let's get it started. Throughout the Western United States, there are dozens of tailwaters that support a rich and diversified aquatic life, as well as huge populations of trout. Each tailwater has its nuances for sure. But the good news is, is a tailwater is a tailwater. And that's gonna be what I'm gonna preach most tonight about is that whether you're fishing on the Bighorn in South Central Montana, whether you come out to the Centennial State and spend a day or two on the South Platte and Cheeseman Canyon or nearby Deckers, or head south of here down to the fabled San Juan River in Northern New Mexico, the good news is that a tailwater is a tailwater. I get asked all the time, well, what about Eastern tailwaters. I'm sure, many of you recognize this tailwater. When my son worked for the Orbis Company, we always went and fished the Farmington River. I certainly don't try to be an expert on these Eastern tailwaters, but the good news is, is success on one tailwater leads to success on another tailwater. And I was able to apply what I learned in Cheeseman Canyon and apply that to other fisheries like the Farmington. I've also had some opportunities to fish the Watauga and the South Holston. Now my son works for Hunter Banks down in uh, North Carolina. So it gives me that opportunity to go down there and fish the South Holston and catch some of these beautiful browns like pictured here and the Watauga. You know, you, you guys have probably fished these rivers many times. Eastern Tennessee has some fabulous tailwaters. So the good news is, is everybody that's watching this presentation and that will watch this presentation in the future, as long as you have a box filled with a bunch of small flies, a bunch of small mayflies, a bunch of small midges, and you execute certain techniques and tactics, you should be successful on any tailwater anywhere in the country. The good news is that in the fly fishing business that knowledge leads to success. First thing we do is we just toss luck right out of the equation because luck is not an important part of fly fishing. We're not having luck. We're executing these certain skills, tactics, techniques. It's our knowledge about matching the hatch. Those are the things that really help us elevate our game to the next level. The more that you know about the fish, the more you know about the tactics and techniques required to catch those fish, the better angler you're eventually gonna become. And the cool thing about fly fishing is you, is you never quit learning. And you know, I've, I've learned a lot from my failures in this game. So if we're gonna have a talk about tailwater fisheries, obviously it would make a lot of sense if we started out with talking about dams and the releases. I doubt that many of you lay awake at night thinking about the role of the reservoir and, and the still water impoundment and the dam and the tail race that um, exist because of that huge man-made impoundment between two towering walls. But if it wasn't for that dam, 
the fishery that we have known to come and love would not exist. So let's take a look at uh, some Western dams to start with. This is a look at Cheeseman Dam. It was named after Walter Scott Cheeseman, who was one of the first settlers in the area. And it's a 221 foot deep dam, unlike many of the Eastern tailwaters that uh, generate power our dams out in the west here are mainly to supply downstream irrigation demand to the farmers and day-to-day -day urban use. So this is 221 feet deep here. This is a classic bottom release. Obviously, when the water's coming out of the bottom, it's going to be ice cold right around 40 degrees. The deeper the lake, the colder the water. This is a great example of that phenomenon. This is a Flaming Gorge Dam. You can see there in the foreground, there's some anglers it gives you some sort of a uh, appreciation for how big that dam is and you can also look to the left there and you can see where that high water line is so there's a lot of flow fluctuation that results in uh, the releases coming out of, of this particular tailwater you'll see up on the top there that this does generate power anything over 800 cfs it does generate hydroelectric power one thing that's unique about this dam is it has mixing towers, so the uh, the government agency that releases the water from this dam has the ability to pull water from various levels. And you probably are going, well, why is that important? Well, if you look at a tailwater like Lee's Ferry, for instance, there's only midges and there's only scuds in that tail race, mainly because the water is so cold. Uh, Mayfly needs the temperature to be above 45 degrees for 200 10 days in the calendar year in order to mature. So it just goes to show you that the water temperature is good, it's cold, but it also needs to warm up just a bit for the aquatic life to prosper as well as the trout. There was a pattern that was created on Lee's Ferry called the zebra midge. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. And the reason that that was created because it's predominantly scuds and midges there. So um, moving on to the next type of dam, we have a few of these out here in this neck of the woods. We have uh, Terriel Creek's a top release. This is uh, Olympus Dam up in Rocky Mountain National Park. And then 11 Mile Canyon as well is a top release dam. So it becomes somewhat of a double-edged sword because the warmest water is coming off the top of the lake during the summer. And then the coldest water is coming off the top of the lake during the winter. So during the winter, um, you, you have a shorter fishable stretch of water in comparison to a classic bottom release tailwater. But 11 Mile Canyon, I'm sure many of you have fished this before. Kirk, I know you have. Um, it, it's just, it's a fabulous fishery. It's one of the best tailwater fisheries uh, in the West. And so much of it has to do with that top release mechanism of, of that dam because you have that warmer water as a general rule. You have more activity from the fish and you also have better hatches as a result of that slightly warmer water. This is kind of a aquatic biologist dream. It's a fly fisherman's dream, generally speaking, because this is what we call full pool in the Rockies. That is when your lake fills up and then the excess is flowing over the spillway here. So we have that warm water coming off the surface of the lake, mixing with that ice cold water coming from the base of the lake, and for a short period of time, we have our water temperatures that are in the mid 50s. I call this the stupid period in my South Platte book because the water temperatures right at 55 degrees, that's when a trout is gonna fill his belly multiple times day to day. And some of the bigger food organisms, you know, your, your crane flies, your stone flies, your scuds, your aquatic worms, those type of things are gonna be dislodged from the substrate from the bigger flows. This is a look at a big earthen dam. This is Navajo Dam in northern New Mexico. You'll see over to the left there that there is a spillway that the government agency that runs this dam does not allow it to spill over the spillway. They don't trust the integrity of that spillway. They do, though, mimic the natural um, flows. And so around Labor Day, you'll start to see this thing get upwards around 4,500 to 5,000 to protect the squaw fish further down river. It's going to mimic the natural flows before the dam was put into place. 
This is probably the closest thing to what you have out east. This is Lee's Ferry. We talked briefly about Lee's Ferry, but it's a big, big dam. This is uh, the tailwater below Lake Powell. This is Glen Canyon Dam. And if you look on the top of that arch on the very top there, that's a semi. That kind of gives you some sort of an idea of how large this dam is. Most of the tail races out here in the West, typically you're fishing them with inflatable rafts or drift boats. And we do a lot of walk wading as well, but on larger tailwaters like this, you would definitely fish them from jet boats. There is one section here of walk wade access, but for the most part, when they're not generating, and you guys can relate to this, it's a completely different river in comparison to when they actually generate. So here's a great example of that. This is the Watauga River. And you can see here that there is a little bit of water coming off that top right spillway there and a little bit of coming out of the bottom. But when the horn blows and the water starts to raise, it's a completely different river. So I think the hydroelectric tailwaters are certainly a lot more challenging than what we deal with out here in the West where we're you know, just we have to deal with the, the changes, the fluctuations, but it's mainly based off of um, senior water rights and downstream demand. Let's talk about the benefits of a tailwater. Once again, kind of understanding the paradox of what makes a tailwater tick. So here's a Billy Atkinson. He is uh, one of the Colorado parks and wildlife biologists, dear friend of mine. He, he's a He's a great biologist. So what makes a tailwater an aquatic biologist dream? And why is there such a robust and very healthy aquatic life in a tailwater? And why, as a general rule, are there several thousand quality brown trout and rainbows per mile on a lot of tailwaters in comparison to a freestone stream? This is the mighty Gunnison. This is where... This is the valley I caught my first fish with my father when I was 10 years old and spent a lot of time over there fishing the Gunnison. Uh, Freestone rivers are consistently inconsistent. I, I love this river. This is the river that my wife and I got married in my drift boat. Uh, we spend a lot of time in this valley. I've raised my family in this valley, but it has its own set of challenges and certainly would be a whole nother talk. Tonight we're talking about tailwaters obviously, but when I compare a tailwater, it's always good to compare it to a unregulated trout stream, the freestone, because you know they're just they're so different. We're looking in a tailwater. We have those you know year-round fishing possibilities, and that's what's beautiful for myself. I've got a guide trip tomorrow, and we had a lot of snow this morning. Tomorrow, uh, down on the South Platte, we're going to have a low of eight and a high of thirty-eight, so it's going to be a cold start. But the beautiful thing is, is as a Denver-based fly fishing guide, I get a fish 365 days a year. And that's mainly because of those stable water temperatures and the way that a reservoir stratifies into three distinct life zones. So during the winter, we refer to that as winter warm, and that's where the warmest water is coming out of the bottom tail race, unless it's a, a top release. And then during the summer, then the coldest water comes off the bottom of the tail race. It is important to note that during the winter months that that water is coming out of the base of that dam at 40 degrees. And as it moves downstream, then the water cools down. During the summer, the water comes out of the base of the dam at 40 degrees and it warms up. So that's important to know. Clear water even during hydroelectric and runoff. The beautiful thing is we've got this big still water impoundment and there's so much uh, nutrients in this reservoir, decaying matter. This all enters into the tail race, produces a very weed rich substrate, algae covered rocks. Many of the tail waters have, you know, swaying grass and very, uh, you know, similar to a spring creek. As I mentioned before, large populations drought. And because of the stable flows, the banks are gonna you know, retain their shape much more than a freestone stream that could uh, run 5,000 CFS and outside of its banks and be unfishable for a short period of time. 
The question is, in a tailwater discussion is, when does a tailwater quit becoming a tailwater? And I get asked that all the time, and I'm sure many of you wonder the same thing. But as a general rule, as the water comes out of the base of the dam and starts to move downstream, the water and the aquatic life, it changes dramatically. Because feeder creeks come in, as a general rule, the aquatic life is going to become larger and more diversified as you move downstream. The clarity is going to change. The water temperature is going to change. And you can see by this photograph right here that there's shelf ice, there's uh, anchor ice. So in a situation like that, if you were coming to Colorado and you went on a river or anywhere and there was ice or slush ice, then it would make complete sense that you should move closer to the source. So the closer you get to the dam, the water, the warmer, the warmer the water is going to get. Batching the hatch, I think, is probably one of the most intimidating parts of the fly fishing world. If you walk into our shop in Evergreen, Colorado, we have 1,600 beds to choose from. And I think... You know, fly fishermen is a general rule. They tend to outthink themselves with regard to fly selection, but it is important to make sure that you have a thorough selection of nymphs, thorough selection of dry flies, and of course streamers are going to play an important role, and we'll discuss that in just a moment here. But I like to encourage people to be well-rounded. Fish nymphs a uh, large you know, part of the time. You're going to fish dry flies during the height of a hatch, and then streamers sometimes you think outside the box. Um, they can save the day sometimes. But let's talk a little bit about uh, midge life cycle. As a general rule, uh, midges are going to make up about 50% of a trout's diet in your tailwater environments. And the interesting thing is, for me, is wherever I go, I always start with fishing midges. I was just down on the uh, Little Red about a month ago and, and found a lot of success with a lot of the patterns that we use back here on the South Platte. So you really don't need to outthink yourself. You just need to familiarize yourself with the midges life cycle. And typically between three and five broods of midges uh, hatch per calendar year. And we should familiarize ourselves with those different stages. If you look down in the bottom there, you see the little green larva. And then at midpoint in that diagram, you'll see the pupa that has more of a robust thorax that contains the wings and the legs of the adult. And then above that, you see the adult. It's important to remember that what midges lack in size, they'll make up in numbers. And when we're fishing the larvas, uh, we're typically going to tie those a little bit bigger than our pupa and our adults. And typically we fish those a little bit differently as well. And typically going to fish those closer to the substrate where their biggest concentrations are found. Typically pale olive, red, and kind of a cream color are the, the main colors that you want to focus your attention on there. Then as a hatch becomes evident, that's where things get a little bit on the tricky side uh, with regard to you know, keeping your flies in the correct part of the zone. Most of your pupa are gonna be shades of brown and black. So you know, you'll see there that the black beauty sizes 18 to 24, the top secret midge Kurt was talking about a little while ago. I've caught fish all over the United States with that fly. The Juju B midge is uh, Charlie Craven's a variation of a midge pupa was very good. And then another pattern that I designed is that medallion midge that sizes 20 through 24. So typically you're gonna fish your pupa mid column. The biggest mistake that most anglers make is they fish with too much weight during the height of the hatch. So you want to adjust your indicator and then typically a number four or number six split shot will be sufficient enough to keep those flies suspended mid column. If we go down to the bottom of this slide, you'll see three different adult patterns. Matt's midge, which is one of my favorite go-to single newly hatched midges, and a parachute Adams. Gosh, one of the most, you know, famous flies, generic flies of all times, but certainly one of the most deadly flies in a wide range of sizes. 24s and 26s is what I like to use for adult midges. And then the high-vis Griffith gnat is going to work well for midge clusters all the way down to like a size 24 for individual midges. It is important to note that in the spring, the midges are a little bit bigger. We call them the gorilla midge out here in the Rockies. So we typically fish those in an 18 and then a large percentage of the year, we're fishing that smaller variety, which is in that 22 and 24 size range. As we move into the shoulder season, that's typically gonna be late March and early April. 
we start to see the first mayflies of the year begin to hatch. And those are your blue wing olives. For us fly fishing enthusiasts, we need to familiarize ourselves with what we refer to as the big three. And the big three is gonna be your blue wing olives, your pale morning duns and your trichos. So on any tailwater anywhere in the country, those are gonna be the three most important mayflies. Now, certainly there's other mayflies that we should focus our attention on, but those are gonna be the most important. Mayflies have been characterized by having that silhouette of a sailboat. It's a cliche that's been used over and over again, but it still sums up their appearance and their silhouette better than anything that I can think of. All mayflies look the same. They live their life. They're about one year in duration. So for a nymph, and then they're gonna be the dun, which is pictured here. They'll live about 24 to 48 hours and then they'll turn into a spinner and then you'll come back and have the spinner fall. All the mayflies have slate gray wings for the most part, but a different color body, different size, time of year, time of day. Those are the little clues that help you differentiate what mayfly that you're trying to imit imitate. Carly Craven's Juju Betis, one of my favorites, 20 to 22, Style Cups Betis is another good one in sizes 20 through 22. But if you look at that top right there and then the uh, left-hand column there, the mercury pheasant tail and a hare's ear, and if you take a parachute atoms, if you take those three patterns, you can pretty much fool trout anywhere in the planet with pheasant tails, hare's ears, and parachute atoms. It is very, very generic, but very, very reliable patterns that I would highly recommend carrying in your fly boxes. The Bar Merger, John Barr is one of the most famous fly tires, a Denver-based fly tire. Again, I would keep that big three mentality in mind here and carry his Bar Merger and Blue Wing Olive as is pictured there, as well as the PMDs and the Trichos. Moving to the right side, we got the Foam Winger Merger that was invented by John Taverner, which is basically a, a Foam Wing RS2, deadly little pattern leading us into the next pattern there, the, the, the Sparkle Wing RS2, which was invented by Rim Chung. That means Rim's semblance number two for that pattern. And we talked about the parachute atoms. You can see the wide range of sizes there, 12 through 22. And then I'm a huge fan of uh, compare done type dry flies, some tied with CD, some tied with deer hair. That's Craig Matthews, Sparkle Done on the right lower there, one of my truly favorite patterns. Caddis flies are much more predictable and much more common on freestone streams, but they're also very important on our tailwaters. The biggest difference being that it takes a little bit longer in the season for the caddis to come off in a lot of our bottom release tailwaters because the water has to warm up. And so in situations where you get full pool and the water spills over the spillway, obviously it's gonna warm your water, you're gonna get quicker caddis hatches and some of your top release tail waters you'll have better caddis hatches the, the magical number there needs to be about 54 degrees before those uh, caddis pupa or pupate uh, for us as fly fishers for us as fly tires we should familiarize ourselves with the three different types of larva there's a case there's a free living and there's a net spinner the biggest differences in the behavior and the uh, appearance is going to take place within those um, caddis larva. All the adults and all the pupa look very similar. The adults like look, look like little moths that can live for several weeks because like butterflies, they can intake fluid. So they'll come back and they'll lay their eggs in the evening time. Far some of the nymphs, um, I, I really am a big fan of a hydropsyche that imitates the, the, the net spinner. The buckskin in the middle top there, that's one of my top guide flies. And then the beadhead breadcrust, that's a pattern that came out from close to your neck of the woods there. That came out of the Pocono Mountains um, and it's a case caddis imitation. On the le left, we got the electric caddis that would imitate a free living caddis. Uh, the mercury caddis was a fly that I designed to imitate the uh, case caddis, the brachycentris caddis that uh, constitutes the famous Mother Day caddis hatch out here in the Rockies. If you're a collector of books and you, you enjoy uh, amassing a, a fishing library, then you probably have caddis flies and written by Gary LaFontaine, the man that developed the sparkle pupa. That's a great bug. And then John Barr's graphic caddis is a pattern that you can't live without on a tailwater. And then on the bottom there, we got three adults, uh, the Puderbach caddis, 
and we got the elk hair caddis and we have the goddard caddis typically i start out by uh dead drifting my caddis but if i'm not getting strikes i'm not getting the results that i'm looking for then i'll typically skate them or impart some action and that usually uh, will give you a quite aggressive strike moving on to stoneflies stoneflies are one of the easiest of all aquatic insects to imitate because they're available to the trout in only two stages of their life the prehistoric looking uh, nymph and the egg laying adult it's important to note that emergence occurs on land with stoneflies so they're going to crawl up on a rock a log a bridge and button and then they're going to emerge there there's uh, four different types that you should uh, be familiar with you have the um, two smaller varieties of stoneflies, the winter stone, and you have the yellow sally stonefly. And then the two larger varieties, probably the more important of them is going to be your golden stone and then your giant or your Terranarsa stonefly pictured on the right there. Let's talk about some of the, um, the smaller varieties like uh, the yellow sally and Oliver Edwards uh, stonefly is going to be a great selection for that. Your smaller varieties of stoneflies live about one year in duration. Your golden stones live three years and the salmon flies live for about four years. So on the two larger varieties, even after the adults have hatched for the year, there's still plenty of stoneflies in the water. So the stoneflies are going to become a year round food source for our tailwater trout. Tungstone is a good one. Um, a woven body type stuff, pats, rubber legs, and a variety of color. Rick Takahashi stonefly is a good one. Paper tiger is a fly I came up with about 25 years ago. Uh, very detailed fly, very fun to tie, but um, it, it takes you know a long time, about 20 minutes. So some of these stoneflies can get really, really um, difficult and tedious to tie. Greg Garcia's mini hot's a great uh, adult for the yellow sally, as is a stimulator. A stimulator is one of the best dry flies of our time. Uh, one of my mentors growing up and is when I was getting into the fly fishing industry was Jack Dennis and that's his pattern there, Amy's aunt. That's a great fly. It won the one fly in Jackson Hole in 1999. Just an incredible fly. And then Clark Stone is another good fly to have for the uh, Terranarses. This is a little uh, winter stone. You can see it crawling on the river's edge there with the snow in the background. It's interesting that mother nature had these stoneflies are black so that it can intake heat during one of the coldest times of the year. And the uh, yellow sally stones are a lighter color, uh, which is beneficial during the hotter times of the year. Uh, size 18 black pheasant tail is a great imposter to imitate that little winter stonefly. So when you start to see these stoneflies crawling around on the snow and ice, it's a good idea to nymph with a, um, you know, with a, black stonefly nymph right along the uh, river's edge. The other thing to talk about here is, is going to be some uh, scuds. You know, the high water season typically is going to be May and June in most of your tailwaters. That's a picture of a Grimeris scud. A few years ago, I invented a fly called the UV scud, and you can kind of see that translucence and that UV sheen to it, and that's the reason that I came up with that fly. I would have scuds in sizes 12 through 18, three different sizes, or three different colors, excuse me, um, orange, tan and olive uh, egg midge combos egg betas combos in the shoulder season two of my favorite egg patterns are going to be the nuke egg and the micro egg and then leeches uh, chamois leech is a good one aquatic worms pink uh, red and earth one brown are my favorite colors pine squirrel leech is a good one out of sight out of mind crane flies i think uh, just a lot of people overlook crane flies just because you don't see them and then down on the bottom, we've got some beetles, some hoppers. Don't forget about your ants. They're going to provide more bang for your buck. And then on the bottom right there, unmatching the hatch with some attractors. It's always one of my favorite things to do during the latter part of the summer is just pound fish up with some bright and gaudy dry flies. The May and June time frame, that scud season is a great, great time to be fishing out here in the West. And then don't forget about your streamers. Like I said earlier that Oftentimes streamers can save the time, you know, save the day when the bite's off just a little bit. Now we're gonna talk and, and take a little tour of what I would say is a tailwater enthusiast. And obviously if you're watching this program, you probably have some sort of an interest in tailwaters as well. And uh, I think these um, 
should be on everybody's bucket list. I think the San Juan River, river down in northern uh, New Mexico is arguably one of the best tailwater fisheries in the western United States, if not the country. And, and it's a, it's an aberration as far as tailwaters are concerned, and, and it's it's living proof that placing a dam in in a river can make all the difference in the world. Before the placement of Navajo Dam in the early 60s, nothing lived in this river but warm water species. And now that the water is being released from a very deep reservoir with really cold water, you have truly one of the best tailwater fisheries in the country. This is a midge factory. These fish make their living eating midges, midges and more midges. And it, it's just really amazing when you see the size of the fish and the number of these fish and thinking about that they you know, eat midges pretty much nonstop basis. Um, brown trout now have taken a fairly strong foothold on the San Juan River. So it used to be once much more of a rainbow trout fishery, but now there's more and more browns. In fact, lately when I've been down there, the brown trout have been representing about half of the catch. It's, it's so unique because you've got this world-class tailwater that's flowing right through the middle of a desert. And it can be, you know, 100 degrees out. It can be so hot, but you've got that ice cold water and this world-class tailwater fishery with this super, super um, robust and healthy aquatic life that really attracts people from all over the country to come down and fish this incredible fishery. So. There's plenty of walkway to access, and there's a couple different floats you can put in at the gravel pit, or excuse me, at uh, the Texas hole and float down to the gravel pit, or you can put in down and below the gravel pit and then float eight miles downstream where you can get away from more people with that lower float. But if you've never been to San Juan, uh, you, you should treat yourself to a few days over there. It's it's a busy place. If you don't like crowds, um, you might be a little bit surprised with how busy the place is, but it's it's truly one of those amazing fisheries. Uh, streamers, you know, another important part of fly selection there, especially with that increasing biomass of those brown trout, like many of the tailwaters, when you have big brown trout, they're eating a lot of smaller food organisms as they grow up. When I go to the Bighorn, you know, I, I go down to San Juan and I always say, oh, the, the, the San Juan's the best tailwater in the West. If I'd go up to the Bighorn, I'd always say the, the Bighorn's the best tailwater in the West. But the Bighorn is certainly an, an outstanding tailwater. Once had about 8,000 fish per mile. It's not nearly uh, those type of numbers up there now, but um, there's plenty of fish up there and the fish are bigger than I can remember it in a long, long time. But the Bighorn is in uh, South Central Montana. It is a hydroelectric fishery, and you're looking there at the after bay, which is really an interesting concept because below Yellowtail Dam, they generate power, but there's a after bay that absorbs those fluctuations um, in water levels. And so the water will come out at 500 or 1,000 or 2,500. So you have uh, the best of both worlds. You have the generation of power, but you have the stability and the tailwater fishery as a result of that after bay. So you can float the upper three, there's an after bay to three float, you can put in at three mile, float down to 13 mile. And sometimes you can put in at three mile, float down to 13, come back up and, and fish the upper three. So there's a lot of different um, floats here that you can do to kind of escape the crowds. It can be a cold place between November and March, but towards the latter part of March, um, it's really a great midge fishery. And then as you get into April and May, it starts to become a really good dry fly fishery with regard to the blue wing olives. And then you see all the traditional hatches. You see caddis, you see your pale morning duns, phenomenal trico hatches, and some very good streamer fishing too from time to time. It's a, it's a, um, it's a scud river. So lots of scuds, lots of sow bugs, and you're nymphing these mid-channel shells. Typically, I lead off with some sort of a sow bug or scud imitation. And one of my favorite flies on this river is a red larva. There's so many scuds, there's so many red larva. It's just a good two fly tandem rig that pretty much will bring you success on any given day on the Bighorn River. This is a look at Steve Galetta. 
he literally wrote the book um, on the Bighorn. And I was very blessed to have had the opportunity to write the introduction for him in that book. If you're looking for a book on the Bighorn, you want to learn more about the Bighorn, I would highly recommend his book. He's a phenomenal angler, phenomenal fly tire, and a really good writer. Uh, you can just see that this, this fishery is so different than so many other tailwaters, but it's beautiful in its own way. You know, you've got a rich ranch land on the on the right or the left hand side of that. And it's just a gorgeous river. It's a big river. And, and the fishing is just truly amazing on this particular tailwater fishery. My wife and I and, and a lot of our friends will pull multiple boats up there and we'll just have a grand time. It's 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 such a, a fun place to go. And I really like the spring months. I like the late March, April, May time frame because later in the year you tend to get a lot of grass and uh, the nymph fishing tends to be a little bit more problematic, but it's really a phenomenal fishery and I would encourage everybody to go see it. One of the benefits of my speaking and traveling the country and, and visiting uh, different clubs is I get the opportunity to partake in some fishing as a general rule when I'm traveling on the road. And uh, that's that it certainly is a big perk and it really has helped me elevate my tailwater game and see, you know, what the country has to offer. And this, this one here, you know, is another um, great example of a tailwater and you say the trout in Texas. Yeah, there's trout in Texas. It's hard to believe, but this is Canyon Lake. This is the tailwater below that reservoir. And it, it's truly amazing. Um, this fishery, you know, when, when conditions are right and, and Texas gets, enough rainfall then this and there's a fine line on that too much rainfall is not good either but if they have fish now surviving in this tail year round they do stock this tail water but it is an absolutely gorgeous tail water it's got a limestone bottom and it's got a really healthy aquatic life so you have the opportunity to catch fish on dry flies um, the nymph fishing can be really good as, as well and it's just it's a wonderful place so i'm going to be heading down uh, to Texas here in about a month. Got back-to-back -back shows, one in Dallas, one in San Antonio. And, uh, you can you can bet that I'll be fishing on the Guadalupe for a couple of days during my visit there. But you can see, you know, it's a quite a bit different substrate because of that limestone um, substrate. You can see the depth changes there, and it's just it's just beautiful with those those cypress trees. Uh, just a unique flavor. Um, unlike so many other tailwaters that I've, I've fished, it reminds me a little bit of some of the, the bigger tailwaters back east um, in, in some ways, you know, with the houses along the sides of the river and the big the big trees. But, you know, again, a tailwater is a tailwater. So when, when I first went down and fished the Guadalupe, I was fortunate enough to meet the, this man right here to the right of my wife. His name's Chris Johnson. He owns a fly shop there um, in, in Round Rock, Texas called Living Waters. And so he was kind enough to show us the rope and you know like i said pretty much a tailwater is a tailwater i mean the, my son's manhattan midge works really good down there it's a top secret midge works really good down there and you're typically just dropping it off some sort of a, a tractor pattern and there is a few uh brown trout down in there but it is predominantly a biomass of really good quality rainbow trout so it's it's a unique fishery no doubt about it moving out to your neck of the woods I certainly don't try to be an expert uh, on on eastern tailwaters, but I have had the opportunity to fish fish them. I've had the opportunity to learn, and I can remember the first time that I fished on the Farmington River. I put on a Pat's rubber leg and a small midge, and immediately started catching fish. Again, punctuating that what I've learned back here in the West also works out in the east. So. Like any other tailwater, just having a box of small midges, small mayflies, Euro jig type stuff. You know, that 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 Frenchie right there, um, about two thirds of the way up is just an absolutely deadly fly on just about any tailwater fishery. And I've had the opportunity, like I said, to spend a few days on the Farmington. I know this is in your backyard and um, it's cool. I mean, I, I, I love fishing new water. I love the challenge of trying to figure it out and the opportunity to catch, catch some fish. So I uh, fished it with my son and my, my buddy, Robbie Jardine from, from Maine. And we were able to catch a few fish, enough fish to keep it uh, interesting. And, 
The most important thing is we had a great time and we continued our learning curve. Moving down to the South Holston, I had the opportunity to fish with Patrick Folkrod, one of the top guides down there. Um, South uh, Holston River Company is his company. And uh, this truly was one of the coldest days of, I've ever fished. Uh, I, I think we had to uh, question our sanity on this day. And as you all know, I mean, in Colorado, it can be 35 degrees and it, it's not that cold. But when you get out east, it's bone chilling cold. And so that's the thing for me, you know, for people that come from the west going out east, you certainly have to prepare better, make sure that you've got plenty of clothing. But this was a was a great day, and we, we brought many nice fish to hand. And, you know, it's fun learning how those gener generation, um, you know, periods affect the fishing and, um, you know, catching some nice rainbows and catching some beautiful little wild brown trout. And then always knowing in the back of your mind that there's some opportunities to catch some big fish like this fish right here that Patrick caught on uh, Blaine Chocolate's Game Changer. You can see that over there in that fish's mouth right there. So there's always that distinct possibility to catch a large fish on the Watauga as well. So uh, picture my son working one of those mid-channel shelves on the Watauga. Again, you know, just there's plenty of nice fish to catch, you know, in that 12 to 14 inch range. And there's always that distinct possibility of catching a really large brown trout on the Watauga too. There's, there's some walk weight access and just some beautiful, you know, big gravel bars. And just, I, I love this river. It's, it's, uh, it's special and catch a mixed bag of rainbow trout. And again, some lovely brown trout with that distinct possibility of catching a large fish there. Good buddy of mine, Doug McLevine, who lives down in South Carolina, he'll frequently make the trip up there to fish this river as well. And then I had the opportunity here uh, about a month ago, gave a talk to a club down in the Arkansas and I got a couple half days in and uh, had an opportunity to caught a couple really nice fish. Again, you got the, the little red, you got the white and they grow some pretty big brown trout down on those rivers down there. So again, just a, a nice opportunity to sample a different type of tailwater fishery with some awful big brown trout. South Platte River, now we're going to get close to my neck of the woods. And uh, the South Platte, and, you know, there's several different sections, but it, it, it's really a chain of, of world-class tailwaters. Uh, it's, it starts out in South Park, which is just a, a beautiful geographic locale tucked in between the Rampart and the Sawatch uh, ranges. And this is the, the dream stream. Spinny Mountain Ranch, which is uh, very uh, reminiscent of a classic Montana Spring Creek. A lot of these riffle run pool tailouts, beautiful undercut banks. You have the opportunity to catch a wide range of game fish. You got rainbows, you got round trout, you got cutthroats, you got cut bows, which is pictured here. Uh, these are the predominant species in there and will make up uh, the majority of the catch. They're very eager to re rise to dry flies, they'll eat nymphs, they'll eat streamers. And this is just a lovely stretch of water closer to the headwaters of the South Platte that uh, you should uh, you should fish this. This is just some really, really lovely water. Moving downstream, the next tail race is gonna be the section below 11 mile reservoir. Uh, South Park section we just talked about is about two hours and 15 minutes from Denver. This particular section here is about one hour due east of Colorado Springs. That kind of gives you an idea where this sits in uh, Colorado. But again, we talked about this earlier, it's a top release tailwater, but it is just a lovely, lovely piece of water, great pocket water, great riffle run pool tailouts, all the hatches that we discussed, uh, phenomenal trico hatch. That's, that's one of my things that uh, I really enjoy fishing in 11 mile. And it is one of those places that you can catch a fish on a dry fly 365 days in a year. If I had one day left to live, one day left to fish, and it's a really easy decision for me. I, I would fish in Cheeseman Canyon as this picture is right here. This is where I do the vast majority of my guiding. And I've been uh, guiding now for a little over 30, 30 years. And it's uh, it's been really an incredible experience for me. When, when I guide, I get to fish through my customers. And Cheeseman Canyon is one of the most technically challenging trout fisheries anywhere in the world. It really has taught me so much about life. It's taught me so much about 
of my career. It's taught me so much about tailwater fishing and the relationships that I've cultivated, the friends that I've made, and the lessons that I've learned um, from this river are unparalleled with any river that I've ever fished. It's uh, It's got a, a robust population of rainbows and uh, brown trout, about 4,700 fish per mile. It's a uh, just a, a lovely, lovely tailwater with walkway hike in access that I would highly recommend that you see at some point in your fishing career. Moving downstream, uh, nearby Deckers, uh, much easier access. Um, Cheeseman is going to be a little bit more rugged, a little bit more difficult to um, gain access to, but that's the beauty of the Deckers fishery is it uh, is close to the main highway and has um, plenty of opportunities. It has about 5,000 fish per mile, and about 75% of those fish are brown trout. Up in Cheeseman Canyon, the biomass leans a little bit more towards the rainbow side of things, but down at Deckers, it's it's the brown trout. So it's a beautiful thing. If I have a customer that wants to fish for two days, then we can concentrate our efforts on those rainbows one day, concentrate the efforts on the brown trout the next day. And this is a picture of my lovely bride with just a really nice brown trout down in that Deckers area. And that's that's the thing that's changed with this fishery over the years is it once was a predominant rainbow trout fishery and now it's almost all brown trout, but it's a, a lovely, lovely fishery. Moving closer to the outskirts of my hometown, Littleton, Colorado, that's where I was born and raised. This is just a few minutes from my home in Littleton. This is called Waterton Canyon. And when you go up into Waterton Canyon, you'd have no idea that you were that close to the metropolitan area. A beautiful little tailwater stretch with a healthy population of brown trout and the occasional rainbow. Very eager to eat stoneflies, a lot of fast oxygenated water, and very, very healthy and happy fish. The Yampa River is another option if you're in steamboat. If you're an outdoor enthusiast, you like to ski, you like to hike, and you like to fish. Steamboat Springs would be a great place to take a family vacation. You can fish the Yampa. Um, there's uh, one particular section um, right below Stagecoach, what they, they call the, 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 the true tailwater. And then as you move downstream, it starts to resemble more of that of a classic freestone stream, although there is Catamount Reservoir and Stagecoach Reservoir. But it's, it's a fly fisherman paradise. Uh, the opportunity to catch some really, really nice rainbows in the spring and some incredible brown trout in the fall, as you see here, exist during that spawn run when those fish are on the move looking for places to propagate. Um, my buddy Steve Henderson, he he's a phenomenal guide over there. And he always um, tells me, you know, if he only could choose two flies, one of them would be a hare's ear and the other would be a pheasant tail. So he's a huge fan of the beadhead. Uh, hare's ear as you see pictured here and then a beat has pheasant tail those are his go-to's this is a uh, right in town of uh, steamboat springs um landon mayor he'll he'll be out at the edison show you can see there that landon's waders are completely frozen the outside temperature is very cold but if you look over on the left there springs are entering into the river thus steamboat springs you can see the 13th Street Bridge right on the back right there. So this is a section, this is an urban in-town fishery that stays open a large percentage of the year. Um, when things do lock up, then you can take a snowmobile and go back in. One of my favorite things to do every year is to just hire a guide and continue to work on my, my learning curve and, and go into some of these places that you couldn't access. Otherwise, this is the fishery below Stagecoach, which is a phenomenal tailwater. And then moving downstream, there's the Sarvis BLM stretch of water and then uh, the fishery below Catamount. So you have another tailwater fishery that's there. I love the section above Catamount, particularly during the spring because we have that migratory run of rainbows coming out of the lake with the distinct possibility, you know, hunting for those larger fish of catching some very, very big fish like this 27 and a half inch cut bow that my buddy Doc Adams caught. Don't rule out fishing streamers with the right to retrieve and the right um, water. You can catch some very nice fish. You can see the steamboat ski area in the backdrop there. And there's some opportunities to catch some really, really nice fish. The Taylor River is a tailwater fishery that's over near Gunnison. Uh, like I said early on in this presentation, I, I had an opportunity to um, fish the Gunnison Valley a lot with my father growing up. Very special. Um, there's three fisheries here that we're going to talk about next. The Taylor River, the Blue River, and the 
uh, frying pan river. These are uh, mysis fed fish. So there's mysis coming out of the dam. One of the coldest days I've ever fished here. This was, I uh, was giving a talk uh, to the sockeyes over at Western State College and uh, decided I was gonna slip a little fishing in that afternoon. Uh, this, this brown trout here was about 25 inches. My son Forrest caught this on a Manhattan midge, which is a pattern that uh, has become quite popular in recent years, but we knew he was onto something after he fooled that beautiful fish. Lovely pocket water and just some great opportunities to catch some, some, some fabulous fish. Again, revolving around those crustaceans, those, those mice of shrimp that these fish are eating and growing very, very fast. So the great sight fishing opportunities in front of the boulders, behind the boulders, and uh, just a nice biomass and mixed bag of brown trout and rainbow trout. And the sight fishing possibilities are, are pretty cool. When you're fishing to fish like this, these are the type of rainbows that you might expect to catch when you're visiting Bristol Bay, Alaska. A lot of high sticking, a lot of short line nymphing, but trying to keep your flies in front of feeding fish can uh, really pay off big time with some really, really impressive fish. I'm moving downstream, this was the section I spent tons upon tons of time with my father. The Taylor is just a it's just a pocket water paradise, just beautiful fishing. Uh, one of the things that I remember most about my childhood was fishing the green drake hatch with my father. And there's just a nice mixed bag of, of brown trout as well as some beautiful rainbow trout. Uh, just great dry and dropper fishing, great nymphing with bead heads and just it's just such a beautiful and pristine canyon, the Taylor Canyon is, but the, the pinnacle, no doubt, and like I said a moment ago, the memories that have been made during the Green Drake catch, sitting beside my father, is one of the things that I'll never forget about my childhood. Just incredible water. I mean, Mother Nature just did a fabulous job with their stream restoration. It's just beautiful. The Blue River, 60 miles due west of Denver, flows right through the town of Silverthorne. Kind of an ironic uh, fishery, kind of, a, uh, it, you know, it flows right through town. And the, Ford dealerships on the left, you got factory out stores on the right, the Wendy's dealership, and, and you've got all of this hustle and bustle that's going on right in town, but yet you have this world-class uh, tailwater fishery because, again, of those mice of shrimp that are exiting from the dam. So the fish are going to grow very fast, thick-bodied, incredible colors. From Town Hall up to the dam is the section that I like to fish uh, right in that Silverthorn area. But I also like to sneak down a further as well. You can see the high water season. It stays clear, even though um, the water's high. Because it is a tail race, it does uh, stay fishable and very clear. A backdrop there is the Gore Range. Bale is behind the Gore Range. And that's just uh, beautiful. It's, a, it's our little, um, you know, version of Jackson Hole. Just a fabulous fishery the further you move down it starts to look and feel more like a tailwater fishery although you still want to continue to fish it like a classic tailwater fishery there's a nice mixed bag of fish in here we've got rainbows and some uh, very nice rainbows that are eager to rise to, rise to dry flies um, there's a lot of feeder creeks that come in so we've got some brook trout in there we've got cut bows cut uh, throats and um, we've got brown trout so you can see that there's just a Really nice mixed bag here and uh, just, it's beautiful. And it, it's one of my favorite tailwaters. I, I fished that growing up with my father as well. And then the, uh, the, sa the, the sockeye salmon, the landlocked sockeye salmon that we refer to as the kokanee also add a little bit of fun and excitement to any day of fishing in the fall months. The frying pan, we've got a couple more fisheries and I'll be done here. Um, again, is uh, another one of the mice's fed fisheries Look at Will Sands. Uh, Will's been a huge um, part of many of my books, particularly when I'm talking about um, tailwaters and talking about um, the mice or shrimp. He, he came up with a pattern called Will Sands, and he's fooled some, or Sands mice, excuse me. He's fooled some really beautiful fish with that. And you can see that mice or shrimp in this trout's jaw here. One of the uh, distinguishing features of those mice are those dark eyeballs. So when you tie those, that's something that you want to keep in mind. But these fish are fat, they're healthy, they're thick bodied, and great sight fishing for some really sweet fish. No doubt the best time to fish any of these tailwaters is during this inclement nasty days because you'll have the, the fishery to yourself and there's some uh, really good opportunities when you have that river all to yourself. 
make no mistake about it. There's plenty of nice days like this November day here. Um, you can see that uh, it's a bluebird day. There's no clouds in the sky. And, and I can remember this day very, very well. Caught some beautiful fish that were preparing to spawn and the, the afternoon blueing olive hatch capped off a great day. This fish was caught on a Matthews sparkle done. I'm gonna close it up with another fishery that's very dear to me, uh, the Williams Fork. This is probably a fishery that many have never heard of. But if you get out to Colorado, I would highly recommend this fishery. And it's dear to me because it, it looks and feels so much like the Gunnison River. It's about a third of the size, but it's, it's a beautiful fishery, a lot of gradient. It's full bank to bank at about 100 CFS. In the spring, you have migratory rainbows coming out of the Colorado. In the fall, you have migratory rainbows coming out of the Colorado as well in search of areas to spawn. Typically, the high water season is going to be in May and June. Runoff is a general rule in all of Colorado. Typically, peaks around Father's Day, and then many of our rivers start to come into shape. And that's when the dry fly fishing really starts to kick up towards the latter part of June. It's a very healthy uh, round trout fishery, about 3,500 fish per mile. Good friend of mine and guide, Chris Wells. Uh, we spent many a day on this river together. Just an awesome, awesome fishery. Like I mentioned this, a lot of these riffle run pool tail outs. Um, it just, if it looks fishy, it is. A few of the Colorado River rainbows left in there, but predominantly Hofer rainbows in this particular stretch because of the huge impact that the whirling disease has on this fishery in the 90s. It's really never rebounded from that. The brown trout continue to prosper. And once you get the brown trout, um, established just like at Deckers, they tend to outcompete the rainbows, and it's very difficult to get those fish established. Uh, favorite time of the year, no doubt, is in the fall. It's prime time. That's when the brown trout are going to move up. That's when the seasons collide and the crowds are starting to diminish a little bit, and the need for irrigation downstream demand becomes less. So the flows are a lot more consistent. So you have really good dry fly fishing. You have that possibility of targeting some of those above average fish that are moving into the Williams Fork to spawn. So it's just a, a great time of year with those cool mornings and beautiful afternoons to um, just catch a, a catch a brown trout of a lifetime. So there's plenty of tailwaters that I probably missed, but due to time restraints, we don't have that much time. So I just wanted to share the ones that are dear to me, and I hope you enjoyed uh, this evening's presentation. The beautiful thing about fly fishing is you never quit learning. As a steward of the environment, you want to protect these fisheries. And you want to um, give back any way that you can. And, and I've certainly been blessed to be able to travel the country and share my passion uh, for these fisheries. And, you know, I, I can honestly say that I've learned more by not catching fish in comparison to catching fish and having spent, you know, quality time with, um, so many guys throughout the country that have uh, graciously shared their knowledge with me. And I try to share my knowledge with as many people as I can. And I've been so blessed to have this young man in my life, my son, Forrest. We've we've done so many wonderful things over the years together. And uh, we just continue to enjoy, we continue to have fun, and continue to fish as many places as we can. Um, I've, been, I've been blessed with the opportunity to write five books, as Kirk said. Um, wrote the book on the South Platte River, a book, uh, Colorado Guideflies, and then two tailwater books, uh, Fly Fishing Tailwaters, and then its companion book, uh, Tying and Fishing Tailwater Flies. And then my latest book is, is uh, Favorite Flies for Colorado. That came out last fall. I'd like to conclude here with this. Um, and uh, this has got my contact information. If anybody uh, has any questions, um, you can certainly, we can talk about that here in a second, but this has got my email, it's got my phone number, it's got my Instagram. If you've enjoyed my uh, photography, please follow me on Instagram and Facebook. And um, as far as I'm concerned, this, this Tailwater seminar never ends. And if there's anything that I can do down the road uh, to help anybody out, just please don't hesitate to holler. And uh, I'll be in Edison in three weeks. So uh, please stop by our booth. We'll have a booth set up over near the casting pond and I'd love to see everybody. So thank you very much. All right.
let's uh let's open it up for questions i'm gonna see if i can stop the screen share there wow all right how about some questions for pat Man, Pat, you've got them all. All right, I got one. All right. Let me share my screen here. Well, that's not really doing anything. There I am. Hey, um, so first of all, thanks. This is very informative. I, I personally tend to um, avoid tailwaters because I find them very challenging with the smaller flies, et cetera. Um, and the one that I'm more familiar with is <clears throat> the um, West Branch of the Delaware, which I, if you mentioned it, I it went in one ear and out the other, but do um, you have any advice for somebody like me who, I mean, I, I'm a, I've been fly fishing a long, long time, but when it comes to tailwaters, I'm almost a novice, so. Um, what can I do to go and, and, you know, have a successful day? What would you recommend? I have never had an opportunity to uh, fish the Delaware, which I, I would love to. My, my son has when he was working for Orbis. And um, I, I, I was going to fish it one time um, with Joe D, but um, I, I never got that opportunity. I, I was really bummed. So that is a bucket list for me to fish on that river. Um, and the second part of your question is, you know, just think simple, think sparse, think small, you know, when, you know, air on the small side, when in doubt, you know, fish something small, fish something black, um, you know, just, just go back to thinking about those midges and those mayflies, you know, and, you know, a tailwater is a tailwater, you know, that, that we talked about that, you know, they all have slight nuances, but, you know, it, it's really interesting because I, I had to go out and, um, do a trade show out in Provo, Utah, and they wanted me to teach a class on the Provo River. And I had 10 students. I'd never fished the Provo a day in my life, and they wanted me to teach a class on the Provo. And so I, I, I got my 10 students. We went out to the river, and, and I told all my students, and I said, you know what? I've never fished this river a day in my life. But I travel the country, and I tell everybody that tails water is a tail water. So it was April. And so I knew that I needed to probably start with midges in the morning. And I figured that there would be some sort of a blueing olive hatch in the afternoon. And everything that I've learned, you know, from past experiences on other tailwaters pretty much came to fruition there. And I was able to get all 10 of those students to catch a fish on a fishery that I'd never been to before. So, you know, I mean, in some ways, it's just a matter of applying the knowledge that you gain from these other fisheries. I think that, you know, it's, um, it can be intimidating when I go to a different fishery. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm a little nervous. I'm a little, a little intimidated until I start to figure things out. Obviously, going to a fly shop and getting some local knowledge, maybe a fly or two, and getting some advice where you might want to go is helpful. But um, I'm sure that you're a, a phenomenal angler, and I'm sure that uh, uh, you'll welcome the challenge of a tailwater fisher, and you'll do just fine. So, uh, Pat, I'd just like to make, um, oh, did, um, for some reason, my video is not working. Huh. Well, I, I'd just like to make a comment on, um, on John, as I've, I've fished a lot of these tailwaters that you mentioned. And um, to me, what uh, separates out the, the Delaware is it gets a tremendous amount of pressure, but also that it is a dual system. You have an east-west branch and a, and a main stem, and, and the, the fish tend to move. So it makes it, uh, it, it really challenging because of the high pressure it has and, um, and also with, with the fish movement in, in the system. Uh, because of this east-west thing. Um, we got a, uh, a question coming through on uh, chat saying, um, 
Can you tell us more about the uh, characteristics of the different seasons in the Colorado tailwaters? Can you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, for us, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're very fortunate to be able to fish year round. And uh, this time of year, there's no doubt it's it's the most challenging because the water temperatures are low and, you know, the fish are moving into the slower, deeper pools. Um, they're not as active. And it, it, it really, it, it, it makes you a better fisherman this time of year. But uh, certainly there's no neat reason to get out on the water super early. You know, typically 10 to 2 is going to be uh, the best time of, of day to be out there. It's going to be predominantly small midges, but uh, it, it's it's just a matter of this time of year in the winter is uh, targeting the right water, which is that slower tail outs and pools and, you know, fishing with predominantly midges, very small, you know, size 22, 24. Uh, it, it, it's very rewarding. It's, it's, it's difficult. Um, you got to, you know, kind of readjust your, your goals and expectations with regard to the amount of fish that you, you think you're going to catch. I mean, if you go out and catch a handful of fish, you've had a pretty good day. But, you know, days are getting longer now. That's great news, as we all know. And then uh, we're going to start to, you know, we're going to, we're not that far away from, from spring. So it's, it's, we're almost out of the woods. If, if I could, and one more question. Um, you, you talk about flies being small, 20 to 24. Um, you haven't mentioned the size tippet you're using with those. Yeah, that's great. Great comment. Um, you know, we, we fish, uh, on my lanyard, I carry uh, like uh, 2X down to, to 5X fluorocarbon. And a lot of the, the middle-sized flies, uh, I, I'm using a 5X fluorocarbon tippet usually a nine foot 5X mono leader, a nylon leader. And then I use fluorocarbon tippet. And then I use uh, a lot of 6X for my small nymphs, uh, just nylon. I don't use 6X floral. I haven't found a reason to use fluorocarbon in 6X. So I use nylon. And then occasionally we have to drop down to 7X when we're fishing some of those smaller dry flies, you know, your 24 trichos or your 24 midges in the dead of winter. Uh, we'll, we'll drop down to some some really fine tippets, but uh, yeah, and I mean, pretty much um, fishing, you know, with a weight forward floating line, uh, nine foot five weight is preferred for the west, four weight for dries, six weight for streamers, and um, pretty much just following that advice that I just said there would pretty much work pretty well, you know, you know just about any tailwater. Pat, is there very much private water on these streams in Colorado? And if you're new to the area, do you have to do your homework to really know where you're going? Most of the, uh, the fisheries that I talked about in, in tonight's presentation, with the exception of the Yampa, that's pretty much all public access. So the, the beautiful thing uh, about Colorado is we have a tremendous amount of public access. And in the ease of getting here, I mean, you guys can fly out of New York and you can be, you know, in Colorado and fishing that afternoon. That's, that's the beautiful thing. I mean, you could literally fly into DIA, rent a car and be down fishing, you know, the Deckers uh, or Cheeseman Canyon section of the South Platte uh, that afternoon. Um, and there's, there's, there's plenty of, of opportunity as far as public access is concerned. And I always tell people, if you, you know, if you're coming out to Colorado, you know, they, if you're coming to the, uh, you know, the show here in three weeks in Edison, stop by. We can chat about it. But if you're coming out, you know, send me an email. Hey, I'm going to be out here. You know, um, where should I fish? What should I fish with? Uh, do you have a place that you might recommend we stay? Um, if you're looking for a guide, I could probably suggest a guide in, in a particular area for you. But I, I think that that I could offer some advice. And, and then uh, maybe, you know, a week before you come, we should probably revisit things just to make sure we're on the same page. And, Things haven't changed, you know, a fishery hasn't gotten blown out or something like that. Cool. Other questions? Wow. Oh, Vince? Cool. 
Um, so if, if, um, if one was uh, traveling to Colorado, what, what do you think of to, um, for the first, what, what water would you recommend as a good starting point in Colorado? You know, uh, I would, I, I think what makes the most sense is, is it depends upon how long you're going to be here. So like if, if you went, if you went down to Colorado Springs, uh, you have a, a, a lot lot of different opportunities you can you can stay in the springs you could uh, access deckers really easy cheeseman canyon really easy uh the dream stream very easy uh, you could go down and fish the arkansas and the pueblo tailwater that would give you four different tailwaters there uh, if you went up into summit county uh, you know up in, near dillon you'd have you'd be right on the blue river um you could still easily access the dream stream uh, but you've got the frying pan within reach. You've got the Gampa within reach. You've got uh, the Williams Fork within reach. So um, I think if you if you if you based out of those two specific locations, um, you could you could hit a lot of different tailwaters without you know overthinking things and having to drive all over Hecking gone to try to you know accomplish the goal of maybe being able to fish three or four different rivers in a, in the same specific area. So. And again, you know, you know, if you guys, like I said, you know, we'll have our booth there. We can talk more about it. And um, I'm going to have, I'm going to be giving a, a, a similar talk as I just did now in Edison, but I'm also going to be talking about the South Flat and uh, I'll have a technical uh, program as well. Um, just more on reading water and those type of things. So um, but by all means, you know, stop by the booth. Let's, let's, uh, let's, chew the fat on fly fishing and if there's anything you know that i can do to help and you might think of a question down the road then uh, we can talk more about it cool any other questions well thank you uh pat for spending the uh a good part of the evening with us um and we will see you in a few weeks down at edison Sounds great. I appreciate it, Kirk. And it was great seeing you at the symposium and I always enjoy uh, your company and appreciate everybody uh, listening tonight and, and welcome me into their home.